Good afternoon. I think it is time for us to start the event. Thank you very much for joining us today for uh, a round table to discuss the central banking, the past, present, and future of it. And as you well know, after the recent or reasonably recent financial crisis of 10 years ago, one of the biggest question, questions is uh, what actually the central banks are doing, what they should be doing, and uh, can we expect them to be effective uh, in the next recession and in the near future? And uh, what are their tools that they're using? Are they up to the task and uh, should they be changing their tools maybe? So I hope we'll have some discussion around these lines. We have a very great representative panel of speakers. And uh, this is a round table without an actual round table. We decided not to cram uh, seven people around this reasonably small table. So we'll have the key presentation by Professor Goodhart first, and then uh, we'll give the floor to uh, the other members of the round table, and then we'll have a general discussion uh, for all of us. So we start with Professor Charles Goodhart who is Emeritus Professor at the London School of Economics and Political Sciences. Uh, he used to be the advisor to the President of the Bank of England on monetary policy issues, and uh, he is the former external member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, so he is extremely well placed to discuss uh, the uh, issues of central banking today. And without further ado, I think I'll give the floor to uh, Professor Goodhead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. And uh, as I was saying to her uh, before, as we were having tea before we came down, I have one other particular claim, uh, not quite to fame, which is that when Theresa May, present Prime Minister, came down from Oxford, her first job was actually in the Bank of England. And she worked for me for about two and a half years. She was a geographer beforehand. But she then became an economic research assistant. And she worked for me in that role for about two and a half years. So if anything goes wrong with Theresa May's ideas about economics, I think that in some respects I am to blame. <laughs> in, in any case, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I, I've been to St. Petersburg before in the summer, and I've always wanted to come in the winter. Uh, so when Yulia invited me to come over, I was overjoyed to have come. Uh, it's also a sort of a auspicious anniversary year for me, uh, years ending in eights. Uh, just about 60 years ago exactly, in 1958, uh, I began to learn economics. <coughs> at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Fifty years ago, I went into the Bank of England for the first time. Uh, and then 30 years ago, in 1988, uh, I wrote my book on the evolution of central banks. Uh, and 30 years afterwards, it's perhaps a good moment for thinking about how central banks have been evolving in the subsequent 30 years. Uh, but first, uh, let me look at the, uh, uh, the central banking over a more historical period. Here we are. That's the one. Um, and one of the uh, hypotheses or theses that I have is the history of central banks has swung between periods in which everyone in the central banking fraternity has got a fairly clear and common idea about what central banks can and should do, and periods in which has been great uncertainty, uh, where life has become more difficult, the economies have not operated as people would have wished, and where the central banks are not absolutely certain of what their role might be. Um, and during the last about 150 years, uh, I would argue that there have been three periods 
in which the role of the central bank has been fairly clear-cut, and three periods in which there's been great uncertainty. Uh, and these periods of consensus, the first one was about, about 1870, Mark of 1872-1873, which really, after the Franco-Prussian War, was the date of the beginning of the gold, gold standard being accepted worldwide. Uh, and the gold standard really broke down in World War I. And after the gold standard broke down, there was a period of really great uncertainty. Uh, and that period of great uncertainty uh, went on until uh, there was, sort of in the 30s, uh, with the election of President Roosevelt in the US and the New Deal, uh, the breakup of the gold standard with the UK going off gold uh, and with a movement towards flexible exchange rates. Uh, again, there was a shift of policy. And during the 1930s, uh, even more so, of course, in Soviet Union and in the uh, Western world, uh, there was a period in which the Ministry of Finance uh, dominated almost entirely the central bank. Central bank was what was known as subservient. In Russia, the central bank really was part of the planning system, where the planning system was really run uh, by the Ministry of Finance. Uh, but even when there wasn't a general socialist plan, uh, the state became much more predominant. Central bank was subject to the finance ministry uh, virtually everywhere, and of course particularly during World War II, and in virtually every country involved in World War II, uh, the banking system was repressed, the banks were told to whom they should lend, uh, interest rates were fixed, again more by the Ministry of Finance than by the Central Bank. Interest rates were changed by the Minister of Finance, not by the Central Bank Governor. Uh, commercial banks in the Western world were organized into cartels, into agreed groups where you, there was no free entry, there was virtually no competition, competition was not allowed. One of the reasons that it was argued that the crisis had occurred in 1929-1933, the argument went that there had been so much competition uh, between the banks that banking margins and banking profitability had been squeezed. That led the banks to reach for yield and go into riskier activities because they were higher yielding. And because they'd all gone into riskier activities when things went difficult, uh, that uh, many of them didn't have the profitability or the capital basis uh, to withstand that. So there was a period of financial repression. Interest rates were held very low, and they were only used, raised, to try and prevent capital outflows and balance payments crises. Uh, what happened in the UK was a period of stop-go. Uh, when we tried to grow faster, we would run into a current account deficit, capitals would start moving out, interest rates would be increased, the economy would go slow, go into recession. Uh, in order to deal with the recession, interest rates were then cut back in order <coughs> to encourage more investment in the hopes of having faster growth. Now, all that went on really until the end of the 1960s and beginning of the 1970s. Um, and the financial repression was protected by exchange controls, which meant that you weren't allowed to export capital, you couldn't send money abroad, you couldn't invest in foreign assets. So there were controls over capital movements both inwards and outwards. Uh, as the economies of the Western world improved, um, and as technology, the technology of communications improved too, uh, the exchange controls increasingly became removed and there was a general liberalization and there was the development of the world's wholesale financial markets, initially through the euro markets. Uh, euro markets actually historically uh, started as a result of 
Russian funds because the Russian funds didn't want to put their money, which was largely actually in dollar form, uh, they didn't want to put their money into American banks. So the euro market started with Russian funds uh, being held outside of the US in non-American banks. And so non-American banks, and in particular banks in London, started having dollar deposits, which is then get traded. This was given an enormous boost by certain American uh, badly designed controls on capital flows, which uh, actually prevented uh, Americans lending abroad from the <coughs> US. But they could lend abroad from American banks outside the US, frequently in London. So we've got an increasing market in buying and selling dollar deposits, wholesale money, large amounts of money uh, from oil companies in Russia and elsewhere. Um, and this actually meant with the abolition of exchange controls and the development of the euro markets, uh, it, it meant an enormous increase in globalization, uh, in free trade, in free movement, free markets, in the breakdown of all the kind of repressions and controls that there had been. Uh, at the same time, you've got the development of economic ideology, economic theories, with the growth of monetarism. Uh, the view that what really mattered for controlling inflation and controlling nominal variables, greater growth of nominal incomes, they're not of real incomes, was a greater growth of the money supply. The breakdown of the repression and the controls of the banks and the ability of banks to obtain funding from wholesale markets uh, led to some very, very rapid expansions of credit um, and the money stock uh, in the beginning of the 1970s. And you got a great increase in inflation and at the same time, uh, particularly with the oil shock in 1973 and 1974, uh, a huge increase in oil prices which was so important in all our economies. The increase in oil prices uh, drove many of our economies into deflationary uh, at the same time as inflation was rising. So the 1970s were a period of stagflation, stagnant economies, inflationary policies, and enormous uh, economic debate between the Keynesians uh, who argued that trying to uh, deflate the economy by depression, deflect, uh, fiscal and monetary uh, restrictive policies would raise unemployment to levels which were unacceptable and that the only answer was incomes policies to try and get agreement between workers and employers about limiting wages but you also try to limit uh, asset prices uh, you tried to limit interest rates um, and the incomes policies to try and control incomes by agreement uh, largely failed. And the, it was an election then in the beginning of the 80s uh, of Reagan, Mrs. Thatcher, uh, combined with the Paul Volcker uh, as chair of the Federal Reserve System uh, who shifted his policy from being one of setting interest rates to a mechanism of trying to control the reserve base of the monetary system in such a way that interest rates could be raised to whatever level <coughs> would bring about a reduction of inflation. And there was a, a period the beginning of the 1980s, 80, 81, 82, uh, when interest rates rocketed up around the world, inflation came down really quite sharply, but it was a very severe uh, depression indeed. Um, and there was, a, there, was, there was a very nearly a major financial crisis in 1981, 
uh, which could have been as severe as in 2007-9. It was the, it's not on anybody's list of crises, because nothing actually ever went wrong with our economies. Uh, but it could have been. It was a period when Volcker raised allowed interest rates, short-term interest rates in the US went over 20%. Uh, that led the American economy to go into recession. <coughs> that led the prices of commodities, foodstuffs, that the Latin Americans were selling, particularly to the US, to drop. At the same time as these economies, which had borrowed so massively, found the interest rates on their borrowing going up. So Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil got into severe troubles and threatened to not to pay, to default. The major banks in the US and some of the major banks in Europe had lent to these countries more than their total value of their existing capital. And if there had been a default, Mexico and Argentina and Brazil in this year, all the major city center banks in New York would have, got, would have been would have been bankrupt. And some of the major banks in London and in Switzerland and in Germany would have been bankrupt too. Uh, it was actually handled, I remember being in the Bank of England at the time, uh, by a form of uh, extend and pretend. What happened was that the governors of the central banks persuaded their banks to go on lending to these countries, which then used that money to pay the interest on their previous lending. So it was a form of, um, of forbearance and uh, evergreening, as it was named, which was done consciously by the central banks until Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil could get back on their feet, and they did. And eventually, by the end of the 1980s, we were out of that particular problem. Then, from about 1990 to about 2007, was the great decades of central banking. These were what is known as the nice years, phrase that was dreamt up by my friend and colleague Mervyn King, who was governor of the Bank of England. It's NICE, N-I-C-E, stands for Non-Inflationary Continuous Expansion. And it was the best 15 years in the economies of the world. Um, more people came out of poverty, um, particularly in Asia. Uh, there was continuous expansion in almost all the countries, uh, and there was very little in the way of inflation. It was, it, and central bankers at that time uh, it became regarded as almost like godlike. Um, Alan Greenspan was regarded in some ways as more important than the President of the United States. Uh, Eddie George uh, in the Bank of England. Um, and the central bankers became independent, not independent to choose what they would do, but independent uh, to decide when to change their interest rates in order to maintain price stability. And they did maintain price stability. It was known as the great moderation because the volatility of our economies all was much less. So central bankers were independent, uh, they were regarded as powerful, they were regarded as successful, the economies were all doing very well, and everyone thought that, uh, I don't know whether you can remember uh, Gordon Brown, who was Prime Minister, had been Chancellor of the Exchequer and then Prime Minister, said in one of his speeches, we have conquered boom and bust. We should never make that kind of statement because it always comes back and hits you. And of course, then in 2007, we had the great financial crisis. We had 
financial instability. We had a time when people were scared that the, the banks in their countries might all close. What would happen to the payment system? What would happen to our economies? And the, the period from the collapse of Lehman Brothers at the end of September in 2008 until about sort of March 2009 was probably in terms of economics, not politics, but in terms of economics, the most scary, uh, the most dangerous period uh, in sort of modern history. Since then, uh, we've had a period of general deflation <coughs> in which most economies have not, most countries, the, the rate of growth of inflation has been below target. Uh, growth has slowed down more or less everywhere. Uh, but there's been, compared with the interwar period when we had very low growth, uh, we had massive unemployment and we had pretty massive unemployment in the 1970s as well. Uh, one of the features has been that although growth has been very low, uh, unemployment has not been as high as people might have expected. With the implication, of course, which is the bad side of that, that the rate of growth of productivity has been very, very low. Now let me go over into a few sort of aspects of that. One of the things that I did not mention at any length was the real bills doctrine in the uh, before World War I. Uh, let me just have a quick word about that. Um, in the 19th century, uh, governments in central, centralized parts of states did not play a very large role in the economies. And that's true more or less everywhere, including Russia. The only time when governments and states played a major role uh, in raising expenditure was when they got involved in wars, which they did <coughs> fairly regularly. Now, wartime is a period where you spend money in shooting off things, so nothing is constructed, it's destructive. So government expenditure to destroy things during wartime doesn't produce anything and is therefore inflationary. As a result, financing governments during wartime is actually a way of increasing inflation. So in the 19th century, the idea was that central banks and banks as a whole should not play a major role in the finance of government. Instead, the idea was that the way that you finance the economy was that you provide finance to business, to inventory, and to trade. And you do that by financing bills of exchange. And real bills, real there doesn't stand for what is now thought of as real, which means you are uh, adjusting for inflation. Real means that these were bills related to actual real production as compared with finance bills which were to raise money for speculation for betting that various assets were going to go up in price. And the idea of the real bills doctrine was that the, the basis of your financial system and where the central bank should operate would be in financing trade and production through buying bills of exchange, buying and selling bills of exchange. The problem with the real bills doctrine, which in many other ways was rather attractive, was that it was pro-cyclical. So that during upturns, when trade and production were rising, there were a lot more bills of exchange which the central bank would buy. But when there was a downturn, there were far fewer bills of exchange which the central bank could buy. And one of the reasons why the Fed in the US did not uh, provide enough liquidity during the Great Depression was that the volume of bills of exchange went down so far that they didn't have enough bills of exchange that they could discount in order to expand the liquidity. And they were very unwilling to, to buy government debt 
because it was thought the purchase of government debt would be automatically inflationary. Um, I've talked about cartels versus competition, about why the central banks encouraged financial repression and restriction during the 30s, during the war years. I just want to quickly mention the nice years, non-inflationary uh, continuous expansion. Um, and some key trends in this were that this was a period, 85 to 2007, when there was a huge deflationary pressure from demography. Uh, the, the, the dependency ratio, the ratio of those who were dependent, the young and the old, to the workers went down. There were there was a, a baby boom, more or less, everywhere in the world after World War II. These who were born in, say, between 45 and 50, were entering the workforce in the, in the I don't know, 25 years afterwards, sort of the 70s. And meanwhile, the uh, reproductive rate was going down in all countries and going down quite steeply. So the proportion of young in the population were declining. Although people were living for longer, that was steadily increasing. So the proportion of the old were only rising relatively slowly. So with the young declining, because the reproduction rate was going down, and the old growing very slowly, and with a huge boom in the, in the working population, the dependency ratio was improving dramatically. Meanwhile, Asia was opening up. Uh, and Eastern Europe was opening up also uh, to the, uh, uh, the world's trading organization. So the supply of labor was sh enormously, there was a huge outward shift in the supply of labor, which meant that the cost of labor was going down. Um, and that meant that there was, there was major deflationary pressures around the world. Um, during this period, fiscal policy was limited but, and it wasn't being used for Keynesian um, anti-cyclical policy, partly because of the time lags involved, partly because it was thought that monetary policy should act in a counter-cyclical way, and then after the 2007-8 by rising debt ratios. So during this whole period, monetary policy was generally expansionary. The trend in interest rates, both nominal and real, was steadily going downwards. And that, of course, made central banks very popular, including with the Minister of Finance, because all ministers of finance like declining interest rates. And there was an enormous success with price stability. And during these years, um, I mean, prices in most of the Western world were very close to the inflation target, which was generally in most countries about 2%. But financial stability became a problem. One of the problems was that the declining interest rates, which were necessary to offset the deflationary pressures caused by the massive supply increase in labor, the declining interest rates uh, were making debt ratios rising very fast. And the declining interest rates were again causing financial institutions to search for yield by taking on riskier assets. And uh, as a result, the expansion of finance in the Western world was growing hugely. I, a phrase that I don't like, which is financialization, uh, showed that the ratio of financial assets and uh, bank and near bank uh, assets to GDP uh, was rising really very fast indeed. So we were getting sort of into uh, potential financial instability. So why did nobody see this coming? There was when the Queen opened a new building uh, at LSE, and I think it was something <coughs> like 2011. She asked a question to an economist who was showing her around, which was, "Why didn't anyone see it happening?" Well, the problem was the mindset. It was a problem about what we thought. And 
What I think most of us, and I think I would probably have to include myself, thought at that time, and I think most central bankers thought, was that there were a number of accepted myths that we thought were true, turned out not to be true. First one was we thought that price stability plus the Basel Committee capital adequacy requirements, CARs, would guarantee that all banks would remain solvent. We didn't think that, we thought that as long as central banks maintained overall macroeconomic stability based on price stability, that nothing serious would go wrong with the economy and that the Basel capital adequacy requirements would ensure that the banks were adequately capitalized, and that would ensure that all banks would remain solvent. Actually, of course, what we had forgotten, what was known as the Minsky theorem, which is when everything is going well with the macroeconomy, people in finance think that there is less risk, and therefore they are prepared in order to maintain their profitability to go for riskier assets. So that everything looks fine as long as everything is fine. But when there is a shock, the fundamentals are based on much riskier activities. The second argument was that with solvency thus guaranteed by the inflation target and capital adequacy requirements, liquidity will always be available via wholesale markets. And so the banks reduced their own wholly owned liquid assets, which had a lower interest rate, enormously. Let me give you an example from my own country. When I was younger, I had started economics in the 50s and the 60s, the British banks were required, and did, hold about 28 to 30% of their total overall assets in liquid assets, mostly in public sector, British government securities. By 2006-2007, the British banks held virtually zero wholly owned liquid assets. When they, they thought that when they needed liquidity, they could always borrow it on the interbank market and the other markets. And what effectively occurred, as you all know, was that You've got the subprime crisis. Uh, no bank knew what the other bank's positions were. Banks are rather opaque. And so the banks failed, ceased to be prepared to lend to each other. They all hoarded liquidity. And the liquidity in the wholesale market simply collapsed. And those who were net debtors simply didn't have the liquidity. And also the maturity mismatch in the banking system can be ignored. And it was all a, 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 we didn't see it coming. We didn't realize what the, the problem was. Now there's a huge contrast in the role of central banks before the great financial crisis or GFC and under the great moderation. Uh, under the great moderation before 2007, from 1990 to 2007, the focus was narrow. Central banks should only worry about price stability because financial stability was more or less guaranteed. Mervyn King at the Bank of England allowed the, the financial stability wing of the Bank of England to decline. The, the proportion of economists and staff working at the Bank of England on stability issues went way down. Now, those working on monetary policy issues went way up. The instrument, one objective, price stability, one instrument, the interest rate. And we had done it, or the central banks had done it, for 15 to 20 years, and confidence was very high. The independence was undoubted. Operational independence to change interest rates, to achieve the target of of, of price stability through an inflation target. Now, after the great financial crisis, the objectives of central banks are much broader. 
not only price stability but now financial stability, even if the institutions with responsibility for supervision, both micro and macro, are outside the central bank, central bank is still regarded as being responsible for maintaining financial stability, which makes it very difficult for a central bank when it doesn't control the supervisory instruments. The instruments are now much wider, because the objectives are wider. And in addition to interest rates, we have unconventional monetary policies like quantitative easing, negative interest rates, macroprudential measures, change loan to value ratios, uh, loan to income ratios, stress tests, which really hadn't been adopted uh, before 2007, were the main mechanism whereby Tim Geithner um, and Ben Bernanke in the Fed sort of brought the American crisis to an end. New methods of trying to resolve failing banking systems through bail-in. But we don't know, or rather central banks don't know, how well most of these are working. Moreover, there's a problem uh, that the main <coughs> mechanism that we have used, central banks, as, well as a central banker I think the word we, the main mechanism that we have used to try and deal with the great financial crisis has to been down to bringing down interest rates even to terribly low, unprecedentedly low levels. One of the purposes of bringing down interest rates to unprecedentedly low levels is to encourage people to borrow. But remember that I said that one of the problems that led to the crisis of 2007, 8, 9 was that everyone had borrowed too much. Well, bringing down interest rates means that they now have borrowed much more. The amount to which our, all our economies have borrowed, and I'll show you some figures in a moment, uh, are now much, much greater than in 2007, 2008. We are in what you might describe in the world a debt trap. In order to deal with the low macroeconomic growth after the GFC hit, <coughs> interest rates were lowered to such a low level that we have built up debt, huge piles of debt. The debt is so high in many of our economies that if we try and raise interest rates, lots of those, particularly companies and some countries, will not be able to afford the debt payments, which they've now been able to afford easily because the interest rates have been so level, low, so low. How do we get out of the debt trap? Moreover, uh, with the demographics changing, the availability of labor around the world, apart from India and Africa, now declining, and the dependency ratio is going into reverse, it is quite likely that the world, having been deflationary, will now become more inflationary and reflationary, and interest rates will have to start going up. If interest rates start going up, there will be a conflict between the ministers of finance and the central bankers, because ministers of finance do not want to pay the high debt interest burden, but the central bankers will want to raise interest rates to keep inflation down, so the independence will be at some risk. So, some future trends. The first thing to note is the future is not going to be like the past. Extrapolating the past into the future will be a major error. <coughs> Demography is going to wor worsen sharply. The dependency ratio with armies of the old needing pensions to live on, needing health care, will rise dramatically. The only way in which you can shift resources into looking after the old and giving them help is to tax the workers, because the only people who actually produce the goods and services which the old will want to consume are going to be the workers. So the taxation on the workers is going to increase. The future for the young, that is most of those who are sitting at the back of this hall, uh, 
is going to be really fairly dodgy wherever you are, even if politics is all right. It's going to be dodgy because the rate of growth is going to be low. It's going to be dodgy because your the date at which you will be able to retire is going to be much later than the date at which my generation are retiring. Um, I think your the age at which you can get pensions in this country is ridiculously <coughs> low. You all, including the women, will probably have to work until you're 70. And you're going to pay relatively higher taxes. And that's coming down the road. Even with that, there will be rising inflationary pressures, and interest rates will have to back up, uh, even excluding our use of robotics and artificial intelligence. And the central banks are going to be hobbled by the very high balance sheets that they've got, quantitative easing. They're paying higher interest rates on their reserves. Now, in most countries in the West, the reserves are now interest-bearing, which they weren't before. The debt ratios are high and rising, and there's going to be political pressure for growth as the growth around the world slows because the availability of workers is going to slow. So the future is going to be even more difficult than the past, with probably more inflation, more conflict between central banks and ministries of finance, and as a result, less independence uh, for central banks. Could it have been different? The BIS kept on saying where well, we could have supply-side reforms, and I don't think that's right, because if it was easy to find supply-side reforms, it had been done. Uh, better governance for corporates. Uh, one of the great failures of Western capitalism, and there are many, is that the incentives on chief executive officers as CEOs are to try and raise the short-term value, the short-term equity value, their companies, because that's what gives them the greatest remuneration, rather than long-term investment. <coughs> going to be more pressure on international countries, to credit to countries to expand, sort of thing that President Trump is aiming for. One of the things we try, might do is remove the tax advantages the fiscal arm that we have on debt. It's going to be a great difficulty of dealing with the debt crisis. Now, that really brings me pretty much to the end. I just want to say, sort of end up with a couple of points. Um, this is the change, the increase in debt since the crisis began in 2007. Now, what you will see is that with the exception of Germany, virtually every country here um, has increased its debt ratio the ratio of debt to GDP really very pretty sharply. And that's because policy with very low interest rates has been encouraging that. HH stands for households, NFC is non-financial corporations, PSC is private sector corporation, uh, private sector, it's HH and NFC together. Uh, government is self-explanatory and the total is government together with the private sector. Bright red is it's increased a lot. So the red shades show how much it's been increasing. White shows where it's not been increasing at all. Um, I, what you will, you will see here uh, is that if we're dealing with households, um, the US and the UK household debt has declined um, and private sector debt in the UK and the US has actually been declining, but public sector debt has been going up uh, in the countries which did not have such a severe financial crisis in 2007-2009, like Sweden and Canada, the debt ratios have been increasing really very sharply in the private sector. Um, and public sector debt has generally been going up a lot, again with the exception of Sweden and Germany. Uh, this is the level of debt as a percentage of GDP. And what you see there uh, is the extraordinary levels of, uh, of uh, private sector, mostly NFC, non-financial corporation, and particularly in the Asian countries. Um, so on the Chinese level of private sector debt, 
uh, and is extraordinary. Uh, but again, in countries like Korea, Malaysia, Thailand, it's still very high. Uh, the debt ratios <coughs> are really very high indeed. Um, compared with the Asian economies and compared with many of the Western economies, uh, in Russia, actually, you're, you're, you don't, you're one of the few countries in which there really isn't uh, a major severe debt, debt crisis, a debt trap. But in most other countries, there is. Uh, and one of the problems is how are we going to get out of this? Uh, particularly if there should be another depression uh, at a time when interest rates are very low. Uh, the debt, existing debt of most governments is very high. Uh, and the problem that governments face is that in most of our countries we're all living a lot longer. And the problem of the, the, the burden of pensions and the health care of looking after the aged and one again, one of the great difficulties of the, of the modern age uh, is that what used to kill us in the old days, uh, cancer and heart disease, was relatively, in some cases, short. Uh, nowadays, with many of us getting living much longer, uh, what we end up getting is dementia, uh, problems with our mental facilities. And dementia doesn't kill you. But dementia means that it is quite extraordinarily expensive and difficult to look after you. Uh, I don't know how many uh, of you have actually lived uh, with a aged relative with dementia. Uh, my elder brother died of Alzheimer's just about one year ago. And I can tell you it's a, it, it takes an enormous amount of care to look after and it is extraordinarily difficult uh, to look after a family member who gets dementia. And the ratio of people getting over the age of 80, and a large number of us are going to be over the age of 80, I already am, uh, but the ratio of people over the age of 80 getting some form of de dementia which incapacitates them is up to 40%. And the medical profession has no mechanism whatsoever yet of actually dealing with it. However, uh, perhaps I might just end by uh, talking about one of the most overhyped exercises in recent decades, which is Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. It is remarkably um, useless as a means of payment. I mean, it is both volatile um, and it has uh, no fundamental backup. Why is it taken off to the degree that it has? Well, first of all, the underlying, underlying technological mechanism for making exchanges between one holder and another, the blockchain, is actually a great step forward. The blockchain, the blockchain <coughs> technique has got great value. I, the means of transferring payments from about, I think, the 14th to the 15th century has been double entry of bookkeeping through a ledger. And that is actually how all our systems have been operating. And blockchain is a new method of actually transferring value from one point to another. And although I think Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies to a large extent will fairly rapidly disappear, I think the blockchain revolution as a mechanism for transferring asset value from one holder to another may well actually continue and come to dominate a ledger transfer system, which is what we had. Why has it taken off so much? Well, it has got the great advantage of anonymity. And the great advantage of anonymity is particularly true for those who want to hide their transfers from government and those who are criminal. 
Uh, there certainly was a view that one of the reasons why uh, the previous surge in blockchain had occurred uh, was because there has been a very considerable upsurge uh, in electronic, electronic criminality, hacking. And one of the mechanisms of hacking is that you, you go in and you effectively uh, remove or disable uh, the memory and you then send a request which effectively says I've kidnapped effectively the hard drive memories and if you want them back you will have to pay a ransom. Now in which currency do you think a white-collar criminal who is involved with cybercrime will want their money paid? And the answer is Bitcoin. And there was a view at one stage, and one of the reasons why the Bitcoin had risen in price was because the hackers knew that they were going to require ransom in Bitcoin and they wanted Bitcoin to become more valuable. So Bitcoin is the preferred medium of exchange for A, the criminal element, and B, the element or the part of the population that wants to hide what they're doing from the government. Effectively, I think what that means is that a lot of governments, particularly in China and Asia and Korea, are going to step in and try and make Bitcoin illegal, which is one of the reasons why Bitcoin has declined in price very <coughs> sharply, by somewhere between 30 or 50 percent, depending on you know, which mini. And there was one point, I think, where Bitcoin fell 20 percent in 10 minutes, uh, which, as you can see, is not a very good medium of exchange when these things, it's, the volatility is of that kind. Uh, I think that Bitcoin will continue uh, because the criminal element and in those countries where it is not banned, those who want to keep their transactions away from prying eyes um, will continue to use Bitcoin. But I think it will be very volatile. Uh, I think that uh, it will eventually decline in price from its present level to a much lower level. I think that the cryptocurrencies of this kind, because there is no fundamental value behind them, except the power that the criminal elements in our economies can wield, uh, and this element I think will be quite minor. Uh, so I, I, I certainly would not advise anyone to go with, to invest in Bitcoin. Actually, it would be quite remarkable. I don't know if it's true about your, uh, uh, in, uh, your emails. Um, but well, after the sh very sharp rise in, email, in, in value of Bitcoin that occurred uh, for, towards the end, of, from about the middle of 2017, I, I started getting these unsolicited emails saying, you know, invest in Bitcoin. I can make you rich by helping you to participate in the Bitcoin revolution. Uh, Whenever you start getting unsolicited messages about some kind of asset purchase, you know it's a bubble. And if it's a bubble, you know it will burst. Um, and so don't, 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 take, don't take Bitcoins, Ethereum, uh, all of the rest of them terribly seriously. Blockchain, the, the underlying technology is worth taking seriously but not the cryptocurrencies. At any rate, that's my view, and I'll end at that particular point. Um, but there's a lot going on. How do we get out of the debt trap? You know, what's the future of cryptocurrencies? What's the future of central banks? Uh, who should be responsible for financial stability, the central bank or another body? Uh, these are issues which is open, which I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, this, these are issues which the, uh, the panel is about to tell you uh, what is going to happen. So I'm looking forward to hearing from them very much to uh, elucidate the future, which uh, you will see. <laughs>
And at my age, in some ways, I'm perfectly happy that I went. So that's enough for me.